This is the strategy inside everything. I'm Adam Pirno. The strategy inside everything is the podcast for people who think for a living. If this conversation gives you an idea, leads to a question, or makes you want to push back on something you hear, go to that's not an insight.com where you can leave a message or send me a voicemail. The best and most interesting will be added to the future episodes, and I can't wait to hear from you. All right, welcome back to The Strategy Inside Everything. I am excited today because I am joined by senior writer at Wired, Kate Nibbs. Kate, how are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Uh, I'm really looking forward to talking to you and learning more about uh, your approach to writing and how you research and figure out what you're going to write about exactly and how the, the research shapes your projects. But before we get started on that, would you mind giving people a sense of how you started your career and how you got to where you are? So yes, so I've been a journalist professionally for 10 years now, or I've been a writer professionally for 10 years now. A decade ago, I was teaching English in South Korea, and I was basically just writing for fun. And when I was a teacher, I would work like write restaurant reviews for magazines that were run by like the expat community. Yeah. And I really enjoyed writing more than I enjoyed teaching. So after I had been teaching for almost two years, I decided to like actually make a go of of writing. And so I just applied to any jobs I could find on the internet. Um, even internships, I didn't get any of the internships <laughs> and I was rejected from like so many jobs. There's so many embarrassing, uh, like, uh, cover letters that exist floating around out there from like 20, 25 year old Kate. Um, but I did get uh, one place took me and it was a, it was a tech blog called Mobilidia and it does not exist anymore. And they really just wanted me to do like pure aggregated blog posts. Yeah. Like it was, it was not glamorous work at all, but I used the clips that I had from Mobilidia to sort of jump to better publications. And so I did that for like a year and a half. And then I was able to get hired by the daily dot, which is a great, a website that covers internet culture. And then shortly thereafter, I was offered a job at Gizmodo, which I was very excited about because I loved like the Gawker Media family blogs. Yep. And I worked there for several years. And then I was, I was very, I've been very lucky because I've been presented the opportunities to work for some companies that I've wanted to work for. And so I was approached by um, Sean Fennessy, who is now the head of content, I think at the ringer, but he was like, we're working on this thing with former Grantland people. If you want to join, uh, that's, that that's would be great. <laughs> that you, that's humble of you to say you're, you're lucky to get those opportunities, but you get those from people reading your, your work. Right. I mean, it's not like, you yeah, just spin a wheel and they're like, tick, 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 nibs. You're like, let's call her. It's I did yeah. get pretty lucky there though, because the Grantland was such a prestigious project. Like everyone in media loved it. And I don't think if the ringer had been launching without a tech vertical, they ever would have approached me, but they wanted, they wanted like funny tech writers, which is kind of a strange subgenre. And so, <laughs> so that's where I came in. Um, and so I worked at the ringer for uh, three years and it was wonderful. I learned so much. I got to write some of my favorite stories ever, um, but I, I had really always wanted to write for a print magazine and, and also the ringer was sort of shifting into podcasting, which is amazing for everyone who loves podcasting, but I am just not a natural podcaster. So you're, you're doing great Bear so far. <laughs> yeah. And so I just really wanted to stick with writing and I wasn't that interested in making podcasting like a big part of my career. Yep. So when the opportunity to work for Wired came up, I just thought it was going to be an amazing chance to work for a magazine that still had a print arm. And it's also like a legacy uh, publication so I just thought it would be something different since up until that time, I'd only worked for digital media startups. Yeah. No, um, I mean, working for Wired must be amazing. 
it's really cool. I mean, I'm constantly almost overwhelmed by how smart my coworkers are. So it's, it's really, it's really cool. That's a great thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I've been there ever since so I've been there for since January, 2020 in January, 2020, I was so excited because I was going <laughs> to go to the world trade center every day and, and be in the Condé Nast cafeteria. I was very excited for this like glamorous magazine life that I had for three months. And <laughs> <laughs> and, then, yeah. changed. and then something happened that I think everybody yeah. familiar with. It's hard to it's hard to remember exactly. Yeah. You know? It, is, it yeah. is kind of a blur, but but mm-hmm. unfortunately I do remember. Um yes. well what I was what I reached out to you about and what I wanted to talk about was you cover a lot of ground in your the various things that you write. You know, you write about culture, you've written about yes, you write about um, technology, but I don't feel like you're ever writing about nuts and bolts of technology. You're, you're always relating it to bigger things, bigger parts of culture. Um, And so when you get an assignment, how do you, where, where do you start with trying to understand how do you know what the scope is at the outset? No, almost never. And it's interesting. I'm, I'm actually beginning the reporting process for two different features I have been assigned at Wired right now. Okay. Then but this normally... is, maybe this is perfect timing. I know you can't talk about them, but in generalities, maybe this is perfect timing. Oh, for sure. So, but normally I don't get assigned features. This is sort of an anomaly. Okay. It's, I mean, I'm not complaining because it's much easier to get assigned features. Like thinking of the ideas is hard. <laughs> Um, but in the past, I have almost always pitched (laughs) more about that. Kate, why is it hard to Mm -hmm. think of that idea? Like what, as a not, I'm not a feature writer. You mean thinking about it and getting it into a pitch format that other people can understand what's in your head and why it's interesting or, or what is it about it that makes it so challenging? It's hard to figure out what deserves a deep dive, at least for me. Okay. Um, because I, you know, I'm a huge reader. That's why I love journalism. I I want to be like the people whose work I read. Mm -hmm. And I I think that you can make almost anything interesting. And I think that there are stories that are worthy of examination behind almost anything in this world, which is why I've never been uh, drawn to a specific beat. I really love being a generalist. And I, I think with the right writer and the right approach to a story, almost anything can be interesting. That said, you need to make sure there is a story that can captivate readers uh, before you devote so much time to it. And I haven't, I don't have a hundred percent success rate on this. I've wasted a truly astonishing amount of time uh, (laughs) (laughs) starting to report stories and then just, realizing that they weren't as interesting as I initially thought or starting to report a story and then someone else publishes the story I've been working on. Tragic. Um, So yeah, finding, I mean, it's easy to find interesting topics, finding the story that you can go to your editor and say, I think there's something here. Can I, can I explore it? Is I, for me, a challenge. Yeah. Um, That's interesting. How do you know, like how far do you have to get into it before you realize, oh, this, I thought it was this, but it's really not, there's nothing there. I mean, is there a, is it when you're actually writing or is it during the research no. phase? During the research phase. I've never gotten to the point where I've been like actually drafting a story and then killed it. Okay. Luckily, I'm yeah. sure that that might happen to me at some point. It's usually in, in still the information gathering stage, although I do have a fairly intensive information gathering stage, which I am very, very lucky to be able to have. Like a lot of people who work as journalists and writers nowadays have very short lead times for, for how to turn stuff around. Wired gives me a, a decent amount of space. That there have been stories that I've, and so did The Ringer, there have been stories that I've worked on for like six months to a year. Not exclusively, but they, they're they allowed to gestate. And that has really made them what they are. Like had I had to file something within a month, it just would not have been the same story at all because they evolve. Like I struggle with pitching because I really don't like to come into the reporting process with like a thesis in my head. Sometimes I have to make one up to like 
get my editors on board. Yeah. But I, I always try to really make sure not to have that be rigidly what the story is about because they can just totally evolve. And I want to be able to give them the space to evolve and not try to hew. Like it's, it's never a good thing when a journalist has a conclusion that they're gathering research and information in order to reach. Right. Then you end up with just confirmation bias reported. It, yes, exactly. So that is like a huge tension within within this process. Like you have to have a pitch that makes enough sense to get assigned, but you can't have a pitch that's so defined that you're like just working towards proving it while you're reporting or your so story is going to be terrible. Is your pitch typically then, does it end with a question or is it, you know, the directionally and so... I want to find out why this is this way, or is it because they have to, an editor has to hear enough to know that there's a story there. Mm -hmm. But if you, I understand why you wouldn't want to go in so hard in a direction about, you know, a thesis. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example. Okay. Um, at the ringer, the last like big feature that I wrote there, we were chatting for a second a bit before we started recording the podcast um, was a s story about, a vice editor who became a drug trafficker. And an, an incredible story. <laughs> I will add the link. Thank you. And so I had been interested in that story for years. I used to live in Toronto. And so I didn't know this man, his name's Slava. I didn't know him, but I sort of knew some of the people who worked for Vice who knew him. And so I was just absolutely, my mind was blown that there was this insane crime ring at this off, this digital media office that I thought was just sort of like a boring Canadian digital media office. <laughs> and so no offense to Canada, they, they know what I mean. Um, so the National Post uh, had released stories, like newspaper stories when Slava was arrested, but there hadn't been like a magazine deep dive into it. And I didn't really understand, like, I wanted to know how he got in that position. I was like, how do you go from a music blogger to a drug trafficker? Like, we know that this happened and the reporters, um, Adrian Humphreys and Sean Craig did an amazing job with their stories. But I was like, just so curious about his motivation and how, how you even, how you even got from point A to point B. Yeah. Their, their reporting was news reporting. It was, it was facts. It was mm -hmm. timeline. It was establishing the, the the main parts of the story, the elements that are make it the news. Mm -hmm. You wanted to know, like, where's the slippery slope that got you? What's the yeah. what happened all that doesn't make the news story? Yeah. And so I had had that question in my head for, for years. And I had pitched it, I think, a few times to the ringer. And they were sort of like, okay, like, if you could... How are you going to report that out though? Like, uh, and I, I wasn't sure I had never done, I had never done true crime reporting before. So I was a little intimidated. Um, but the way that it got greenlit was I DM Slava, who was the drug trafficker. <laughs> and I said, I want to write about you. And he responded, which I was very surprised by because he was, um, a big fan of the ringer and he was, curious oh wait actually i'm misremembering this <laughs> i did not dm slava slava dm'd me about something separate he was i actually did have a podcast for the ringer for a short amount of time oh okay which i was shocked that he listened to um because i was i just i had a hard time with it it was not a natural fit for me my co-host justin charity was great but i was really struggling but slava really liked my podcast and it went it it stopped being a podcast. Like they were like, we're not going to do this anymore. So what? He DM'd you asking when the next episode was like, what happened to your show? Yeah. He was like, who should <laughs> I reach out to? I want to listen to more episodes. And I was like, oh, uh, don't worry about that. Thank you. But I was like, hey, I've actually always been curious to hear more about your story. If you would consider talking to me for an article, I would love that. Um, and he said, yes, as long as I would come to his mother's house in Brampton, Ontario, because that's where he was on house arrest. Uh. Um, and he did not really want to talk over the phone. Um, and so at that point, no one had spoken to him like the newspaper 
reporters, they hadn't, they hadn't interviewed him. Um, so I, I had a potentially like exclusive thing that no one had reported out yet. So I went to my editors and I said, Hey, you know, the story that I've been talking about, how did this vice guy become a drug trafficker? Like he will talk to me (laughs) if you let me go to Canada. And so they said, yes. It also helped that I had a bunch of friends and family still in Canada. I'm a Canadian permanent resident. My husband's Canadian. Um, so I stayed with friends for most of my reporting. You and kept so the expenses way down. I kept the expenses down. Yeah. So that was how that reporting process started. Quite unconventional for your subject to reach out to you. But that is what happened. That's pretty good timing. Yeah. And but he reached out to me, I think, in April of 2019. And then I went, I started reporting the story after that, like talking to vice people. And then I went to visit him in, in July of 2019 and August. And then the story didn't end up being published until December. So it was a, it was a large chunk of time that I was primarily reporting that story because there were a lot of different there are a lot of different elements. It was also that story is a great example <laughs> because you can't you couldn't possibly just have taken your time with him as the gospel. Mm-hmm. But you're also dealing with drug trafficking. So how do you go to get other sources? I mean, how are you even able to contact some of those people or get people to speak comfortably about it? So I anything Slava said I had to fact check before I included it in the article. And there, so there's a lot of stuff that he told me that did not make it in there. Cause I was like, I have no way of verifying this. And if there was ever something that he said that was contradicted, I included the contradiction. And then it became clear that he was definitely not the most reliable narrator. And so I tried to make that very explicit in the piece. Like this is not someone whose word you should be taking as gospel. Right. Um, and I was really sad because his co his alleged co-conspirator um, is awaiting trial still because he is pled not guilty. Slava pled guilty. And so I didn't get to speak to him. He wouldn't speak to me. I got to speak to his lawyer, who was a total character and I included that. But there were voices that I really wish I could include, could have included. Um, yeah, so that a big reason why that story took so long to report was because I was doing all of this secondary reporting to try to confirm what Slava was saying or offer a, a different account. Um, and yeah, so I didn't, I didn't always have like that story very much ended up being about the circumstances that led him to be a drug trafficker. And it was sort of a media story. Like my, my angle was very much like what happened at Vice Canada that made this guy become a drug trafficker. There's like a million different versions of that story that could be told that like weren't so vice heavy, but that just seemed like the most appropriate angle for the ringer to take because I was, I had been writing about media. Um, There's like another version of that story. Like there were, you know, there were associates in the criminal underworld that he discussed that like I could have chased it up the the pyramid. Um, but I recognize my limitations there. Like it was my first true crime story. Um, the ringer is not really in an, like a, in, it's not an investigative journalism outlet. Right. Um, my editor, Amanda Dobbins is amazing and I'm sure she could handle that kind of story, but like, it just seemed like it would have been a weird choice for me to try to really like expose the, the, the underworld big wigs. Yeah. Yeah. That goes, that goes beyond what, what the ringer is yeah. about. So how much yes. of your work then, is that one of the the boundaries that you create for yourself as understanding the tone of Wired or the ringer or Gizmodo and saying like, oh, I can talk to that person, but that's probably over the line. But let me, let me think through. Is that one of the first checkpoints that you make for yourself is, is like a, a tone or topic? Safety? Yes. Yes, definitely. I mean, There are stories that I would love to write, but because I work for Wired, it wouldn't make any sense for me to 
write them yeah. and same with same with at the ringer wired actually has a history of doing amazing true crime reporting yes, um do. yeah so that i'm excited about opportunities there um but you know i wouldn't be writing like a profile of a uh athlete at wired unless there was some sort of <laughs> unless, they unless were an it was an ad, in some kind yeah. of startup or something yeah yeah exactly so yes that is always important figuring out whether the story that you want to tell is appropriate for the publication that you are writing it for or pitching it to because i'm a staffer i don't really freelance for other publications so it right now it is essential for me to figure out stories that make sense for wired Got it. So you stay in that wheelhouse and mm -hmm. really know that. How long does it take when you start at a place like Wired? How long does it take for you to figure that out? Or do you start in a more conservative mindset and push push with your elbows as you go? Um, I tried really hard before I started Wired. Uh, there were a few weeks in between starting and, and ending my ringer job. I, I was on a spree of like reading all of the back issues that I could get my hands on and just trying to understand what the publication needed from me. Mm -hmm. Um, luckily it is there, you know, they publish a pretty wide variety of articles that are only like loosely related to technology. It's very much more about like, the stories need to have some sort of hook that pertains to like the way we live now or the way that we're going to live in the future. It's like they, they need to be sort of forward thinking um, in some way more than like have an explicit, this is about an app yeah. um, angle. Uh, I'm still learning what makes a great wired story to be honest. It's been my tenure at wired has been, kind of weird because I started and the pandemic happened and then I ended up being sick and wow. going on maternity leave for like most of 2021. Yeah. So I'm sort of like re re-entering the world of Wired right now. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a process. So you start with a direction for the story, not a, not mm -hmm. a, you don't hem yourself into a, an angle yet. Yeah. And then so in the case of the the vice story, you had the subject, you know, that kind of serendipitous contact with them. But in yes. the case of like the story you shared about um, Clickhole, mm -hmm. like where do you where do you start when you know it's going to be or could be this sprawling story? I was interested in writing about Clickhole because I love Clickhole. It's one of my favorite websites, and I saw that they had separated from the Onion, which was it was a spinoff of the Onion originally. Yep, and it had, it was an independent company. Now it was, um, cards against humanity had purchased it, but then like given it back to the click hole staff. I was fascinated by the fact that the click hole staff, a was separate from the onion now. And it was this like media co-op. And, uh, I was also personally interested in it because it had been owned by great hell equity, which is a private equity firm that had also purchased the Gizmodo Media Group. Um, so I had sort of like a personal interest in the story because I felt sad seeing what was happening to like Jezebel and Gizmodo and these yeah. other blogs because I had worked at Gizmodo um, and I loved those blogs and they were really being like desiccated by Great Hill Media. And I had seen that happen to the onion as well. Like they, they changed the format. It, it just made me so sad that these really wonderful digital spaces were being treated this way. And it seemed like Clickhole had, had managed to escape and no one had written like a deep dive. How do Clickhole do this? How are they going? Like, what's their business model? What does this mean for digital media? Is it right. a viable path forward? So those were like the questions that I started out wanting to answer. But I wanted to uh, document it for the historical record because I thought it deserved like a serious look. So that's what that's how I sort of pitched it was that, you know, this company is doing something very unprecedented. And so this is a media story. This is a story about digital media. Right. Um, but it, because it's also particularly about this really wonderful special website, it, it can double as like a history of the website and a history of online comedy. And, and you would yeah. have, I mean, you pitched it as a feature. Yes. Um, I yes. wonder if 
even if you only ended up with the pocket history of it, if you if it would have still been valuable published in that way where it didn't get into some of the areas, that, the territories that the <laughs> final story covered, because it is a weird winding road that, I knew I, now when you're when you're saying it, I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember a headline about that. I remember a headline about that because that's all I mm-hmm. read is, you know, it's a tweet. And I go, oh, they bought it. They bought it. They sold it. They sold it back. Mm-hmm. But reading the article, I was like, oh, yeah, but look at all this other juicy parts of it that are in the background that that we get to know about because of the, the research you did and the conversations you had. Uh, yeah, I would have loved to. It was funny because during that process because I loved Clickle so much. I think one of the drafts that I turned in was like 10,000 words long. And they were like, <laughs> you can't like, this is too much for wired tweeters as like, this goes back to what we were saying about making sure your story is appropriate for public, like w- what publication you're writing for. Um, my editor, Sandra Upson, who's also amazing, really helped me shape that story into like the best version of it for Wired, which was not a 10,000 word history of her cult, <laughs> even though I <laughs> wanted to write that. I mean, that's, and half I was, a, that's half a book actually, right? <laughs> yeah. And I was really sad because I talked, the people who worked at Clickle and The Onion were like incredibly generous with their time. And that was one of the reporting processes where like, I talked to Chad Knackers, that's his real name. He's the current editor in chief of The Onion for like an hour. And he said so many wonderful things. He walked me through the whole history of his time at The Onion. That's cool. And I think I quoted him. He's like a sentence in that piece. Like that was uh, really a case of me a little bit over reporting because I just was so psyched to talk to all of these people that I, my, my research process was possibly too intensive because <laughs> I had to write some, some of the wonderful people that I spoke to and say like, I loved our conversation. None of it actually made it into the final piece, but like, thank you because it really did inform it. And it really did give me, I think like, I, I felt like I was an expert on the onion and cocoa when I was done with that reporting How process. Much? And it was because they were so generous with their time, even yeah, though so I did not quote most of them. That's you just touched on something really interesting. When you do an interview for that story or for any other story, and you, you talk to five people, but you only end up using one sentence. How mm-hmm. valuable are those other interviews at providing, like, how do you employ the context that you gain how do you, it does, how does it shape the story or how do you know when something's valuable? Even if you say, I can't use this quote. Mm-hmm. But. I mean, it just makes me feel confident that I'm portraying this situation accurately. Like mm-hmm. even, uh, I almost always get something valuable from my interviews, even if I don't use any of it in the finished piece, it almost always is enriching my the background knowledge that I like do need to be confident that I'm not totally screwing the piece up. And in in that story, um, I was probably like, I had talked to about, I think like 25 people. And I think, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but I was pretty far along into the reporting process when I talked to someone who actually had something critical to say about ClickHole's work environment. And I was shocked because I had talked to so many people who really only had positive things to say about it. And so that really threw me for a loop. That was actually, that sort of extended the uh, reporting process considerably because I was like, oh my gosh, okay, I need to check this out. And then, you know, a few different people ended up having some critiques of the workplace culture. And that did end up in the final product because it seemed like I couldn't write an accurate an honest, uh, like complete right. uh, depiction of this company without incorporating the fact that some of its alumni thought that it had like room for improvement. And then it ended up, you know, that, that piece was reported in 2020. That was like a really big summer where people were reckoning with uh, like racial disparities on staff. And so it just seemed like something that I couldn't ignore because I'd already done so much reporting and I loved the website so much. Like it really pained me that I had to now, <laughs> I was like calling my editor being like, I'm going to need more time with this story because I, I have to look into all of this and check it out. And I, uh, am likely going to include it. And, uh, that that's like another example of how you don't really know what's going to come up in the 
reporting process, I didn't really see that coming. And then I had, it was, it's also an example of how like, how painful it can be to be a reporter who's conflict diverse, because then I had to go back to like all of these people who loved Clickhole and currently work there and say, Hey, like some people have complaints about you yeah. and I need you to respond. And, and it's not like you're working at a, at a daily where you're talking to the local politician and in their face every day, challenging them on those, those kind of bullet points. You, you yes. already talk to them as a kind of a friendly face. Yes. So it's hard to go back. I, I get it. It's um, rough, but it's necessary. Like had I published that story without incorporating those critiques and giving the people who had, I think like valid points to make about the staff's uh, overwhelming like whiteness and maleness and what that meant for its content. I, I don't think it would have been as accurate or fair a piece. And I still love Clickhole and I love all the people that work there and wish them the best, but I just had to, it, that's what journalism is. You have, yeah, to, you have to tell the whole story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How um, many so words that was, did that how many words did that story end up being from your 10,000 word draft? I think it's between three and 4,000. Oh, so still quite a, a bit shorter. Yeah. Yes. It's still a pretty hefty story. Yes. And I don't know if I'll ever get around to actually writing that complete history, but I hope someone does because there were, it's, the, it it's a fascinating place. More meat on that bone, huh? Oh yeah. <laughs> there always what is. If you get an assignment you, we talked about Vice. That was a story you were interested in. Clickhole was mm -hmm. something you were passionate about and wanted to know about. What if you get an assignment that is for something that you could care less about? You're, you know, not negative about, but more like, eh. Yeah. So that has happened to me. Um, almost always <laughs> I take the assignment, actually, because I, when I wanted like when I initially got into writing, I truly did not care about technology at all. I didn't have a smartphone. I just, it wasn't my thing. And that those, was just- Those were the, the days before the smartphone. <laughs> no, everyone else had a smartphone. I was like one of those people who was a diehard. I'm, I'm, I don't care about gadgets. And then I ended up working, my first job was for like literally a gadget blog. And so- <laughs> one of the things that that taught me was that there's almost always an interesting story like as I was saying before, like, doesn't really matter what the topic is on the surface. It's like what, what you can, what stories you can find underneath. And so, uh, for example, recently I was assigned a story like on sort of a broad topic or to like find, find a story. Uh, and I didn't really care that much about the broad topic, but while I was trying to think about what I could write, I found like something within that broad topic that I was interested in and I, I thought could make a good story. And so I, I, I like to say yes and then try to figure out if I can say something before I say no right away. I assume that my editors want me to look into something because they think it's interesting. And if right. they think it's interesting, they're all really smart. So there must be like some reason. There's something there yeah. for sure. It's just about yeah. finding it. Yeah. Because they won't, they also won't send you on a direct crash course with a hypothesis or like a, a direction that they want you to take. It's more find out more about this and see if there's something there. Yes. Like if I was to get assigned fully a story, that would be great because like determining what thread to pull can be tricky and also time consuming. Is that, but, is that gut or is it at this point now you're doing this 10 years is, is figuring out which thread to pull is that now intuitive to you or do you have to go talk to it? Not do you have to, but do you get it from saying to an editor, like I found these three directions, can we talk through them or, or how do you know which, which third is the right one? I try to think of like, what, what would I want to read about this? Like just as someone who's flipping through a magazine, what would interest me about this topic that I would like sit down and read the story it's always a good gut check for me to like tell my family what I'm thinking about working on because they don't really ever, <laughs> they're not like huge readers. They're not super plugged into the world that I'm plugged into. So if they think something's interesting, uh, then I'm usually very confident that it, it actually is. And if they're kind of like, Oh, maybe I know I need to, I'm going to need to do a little more work to get the story where it needs to be for like a general audience. 
I do. I do the same. I pitch. I pitch book ideas to my wife, and she's like, "Yeah, yeah." yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, why would I? Why would I read that? Yeah. yeah okay. Fair. Um, does, is the research process the same on a story that you pitch versus a story you get assigned? Yeah, does your more or less. Information gathering go the same way, or is it vary? It more depends whether like how defined my question is. So like with the vice story, I had already done all this background research, just being generally interested in the topic. And then once I decided I was going to write about it and I was going to interview Slava and it was sort of going to be about how did this guy go from point A to point B? Um, that was like a more narrow question. If, if I'm assigned a story on like a topic that's more general, like say a company in, in particular, um, my background research is, is more extensive because I need to read everything I can to figure out like what the more narrow thing I'm going to say about the company is. Um, my big tip for anyone who like wants to research things is I am a big fan of using Google's, like you can set the time parameters of what you're looking up. And mm -hmm. so I'll, I'll go back to make sure I'm not getting just like random news articles. And I'll basically just try to read everything that's been written about a topic, like since the thing happened. And uh, yeah, those, those like time settings can be really, really great for that. Cause they can pull articles up from like the, the time period that you're looking into versus more recent stuff. You must, writers um, must have the best Google tips of all time. <laughs> I've never heard, I don't know that one actually. I've never used yeah, that. it's it's really helpful. Um, Internet Archive. Um, I don't know if you use their. Uh, they have like a way a thing called the Wayback Machine, where yeah. you can see older versions. Like that's super helpful. Um, but yeah, I try to read. I'm I'm a really extensive reader. I try to like read everything that I possibly can that's been written about the topic that I'm going to write about first, um, and then. That also helps me find sources in a lot of cases. Um, another great way to find sources is to go on LinkedIn, like LinkedIn rules, uh, especially <laughs> if you are going to like write a profile of a company or you're writing about a company. Like that's how I find a lot of um, former and current employees. And yeah, I'm trying to think. But yeah, so basically like step one is always read. Step two is to figure out who to talk to and try to get them to talk to you. Um, those are like basically always the two like parallel backbones of the research process. And that'll, that usually should give you the framework you need to know. After that point, you know if you have a story or not for the most part. Yeah, yeah. Like a story that I'm currently working on, I, was, I read everything that I could about this company that I'm going to write about. And I was like, you know, there have, there had already been a lot of great pieces that were just sort of like general profiles. So I was like, I'm not going to do that because it's already been done. Right. So now what I'm, I, anyways, I found like something that hadn't been written about them. And then I was like, I'm going to focus my efforts on, on this and like exploring this particular part of this company. Um, but I wouldn't have known to do that had I not looked at like what had already been said about it and what should be said about it in the future, if that makes sense. Yeah. So you're using those other stories as your foundation and, and the background to know you can make an assumption, okay, people may already know this, or this is this is ground has already been covered. So I can stand on those shoulders and figure out what's the next part totally. of the story that to be told. Yeah. Cause like I really see journalism as a collaborative process like across the space. It's like we're trying to write the first draft of history. That sounds very grandiose. We're I'm coming to you from a basement. Like it's not that exciting, but <laughs> we are we're all doing the same thing. I never want to write, I never want to report something that someone's already reported. Like to me, that's just a huge waste of time. Um, and so it's really important to acknowledge other people's work and look at other people's work and see what can I bring to the table that has not been brought already. And because you're trying to add, if it's, if it's a subject that's already been covered, you're trying to add mm -hmm. new dimension to that, to give someone who's really interested in that topic, who does that same Google search you do 
then they get this other facet of it that they can say, oh, okay, but here's this part of it. I didn't know about this. Yes, totally. Oh, that's incredible. Well, Kate, um, this has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much for making time and coming to me live from your basement. I appreciate it. <laughs> Anytime. This was really great. Where can people, people can find you on Wired and in print mm -hmm. and Wired. Um, where else can people find you online? So I have a Twitter account. Um, I will warn you that I tweet some really stupid things, but if you want to follow me there, <laughs> great. Uh, and it's my last name. It's K-N-I-B-B-S at K-N-I-B-B-S Nibs. Um, and that's really the only place that I am professionally, like I have an Instagram, but it's mainly pictures of my baby. So I'm not even going to say what my that's name the is. That's the more important stuff, but yeah. 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 And yeah. So right now wired, it's a great magazine website. You should subscribe. Uh, they're very cool. That's fantastic. I will uh, link to your writer page on wired and to your Twitter account. Thank Thanks you again for making time. Of course. Strategy Inside Everything is produced by me, Adam Pierno. If you like what you've heard, leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Actually, I have no idea if that helps or if it's ever done anybody any good. If you really want to help the show and you like what you've heard, share it with someone else you think will dig it. That's the best way to help the show and keep the conversation growing. If you have an idea, a question, or want to push back, go to thatsnotaninsight.com where you can send me a message or leave me a voicemail that will be added to future shows. Music for the strategy inside everything is by Saw Square Noise. For more information on me, you can go to adampiero.com to learn about my books, my speaking, and my consulting practice. Thanks for listening. <laughs>